This is Danny Bobro, president of AIM Dental Marketing, welcoming you to this installment of the Practice Perfection Web-Based Education Series. Today's webcast is titled, Get Your Life Back, and will be delivered by Dr. William Kimball. Bill is co-founder of the Build-Up Group, president of Kimball Consulting, Inc., founding partner of Integrity Practice Sales, and lead wine educator at Find the Right Wine. As an attendee at today's webcast, you will discover blind spots most dentists suffer from, learn details about seven proven systems that save time and increase profits, discover how to slow down and produce more, gain confidence in becoming insurance-free, learn three key traits needed to ensure a cohesive team, create a plan to increase your enjoyment of dentistry, quality of care, and take-home income, Discuss strategies to take more time off and reach your goals each month. And most important, see real examples of dentists like you achieving all of the above. Today's event will run for around 90 minutes. While attendees are in listen-only mode, we invite all of you at any time to submit your questions or comments using the question button on your screen. We will allow time following the presentation to get your questions answered. If we do not get to your question during the webcast, We'll see that it's answered shortly thereafter. Attendance at this presentation entitles you to apply to receive one and one half hours of continuing education credit. Shortly following the webcast, we will send you an email with instructions for receiving your CE. Please note that the code for this course is KIM063022. I have included that in the chat, so you should have a written copy of it. But again, that code is KIM063022. You will need this code to request your CE, so please, please be sure to write it down. And now it is my distinct pleasure to welcome to the Practice Perfection stage my friend and colleague, Dr. Bill Kimball. Hello, Bill. Thanks. Hey, Danny. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak to your group. Uh, sounds like we've got a nice group out there. So thanks everybody for signing up and attending. And I promise I'm going to do my best to make this worthwhile, profitable, and perhaps even fun. We'll see. So I appreciate your uh, allowing me to be involved. It's our pleasure, Bill. Thank and you for joining us. Thanks, Danny. Thanks. Well, so how do I get my life back? You signed up for this because um, you see me promising a way that you are going to be able to discover um, how do I work less and achieve more? Who, who wouldn't want to do that? And I hope by the end of this presentation, you'll see that um, we, we think that it's hard to do that, but when we uncover some blind spots, um, there are some things that you might be missing. Now, I know some of you are just starting out in practice and this might all be new to you. Some of you could probably give this lecture and as a consultant, um, a lot of what I do is encourage doctors to do what they've heard before, they just aren't doing it. So let's dive right in. Um, how, do, how do we work less and achieve more? This was my path. First, I did it the wrong way. Um, this was about six years ago. I was, uh, went in late to the hospital and they told me I was having a heart attack. So I took an ambulance ride from one hospital to the other and they did an angiogram and turns out I wasn't having a heart attack but it was it was scary and it it really made me kind of wake up and and look back at my life because there are things in my life that I just wanted to accomplish you know the the goal was here and I made it this was last October um married off my daughter to a wonderful guy I've got three kids and Two are married. I hope to be walking my third down the aisle one of these days. Um, but this is really what it's all about, just enjoying life and not working too hard. Uh, like all of us, we've had humble beginnings. Uh, Loma Linda Dental School, 1987, me and my lab partner, Steve Powell. Um, for those of you younger dentists, have a look. I'm not wearing gloves. That's how we did it back then. Um, <laughs> but those, those were good times. And I enjoyed dental school. It was a great experience at Loma Linda. And then I graduated and took over a, a tiny practice. Um, 
in in today's dollars we went from maybe 50,000 a month to about 150,000 this is my journey so just going to walk you through my journey very briefly um and i hope this might inspire some of you some of the, these numbers are going to be a lot smaller than what you're doing right now and some may be bigger we'll see we have all kinds of different practices i'm sure represented on this call so i i tripled the production of this practice in about 8 years I went from five days a week down to three and a half days a week. I went from one day a week of hygiene to 13 days a week of hygiene. That was kind of crazy. Um, I went from two weeks off to six weeks off and get this. And if there are team members listening, this is great. If it's been done, it must be possible. I paid my team six weeks paid vacation every year. They just had to vacation when I vacationed. That was our deal. And if we made goal every month, uh, I told them I didn't care if we worked four weeks or three weeks or two weeks. If we make our goal, our production and collection goal, more importantly, our collection goal each month, uh, I'd rather work less, frankly. So we were taking a lot of time off. Profitability in the practice increased four times. And after eight years, I got to a point where I could sell my practice. And I, I thought maybe retire. I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do. Started telling people how I did it. And I became a consultant. So that's my story in a nutshell. So then I started uh, another path and that was traveling all around the country to coach dental offices. Um, I think I've coached dental offices in about 40 states and um, I'm at about office number 1000. So I have defi definitely have gray hair and have learned a lot along the way. Uh, and I'm going to share with you some of the things that I feel are things that will change your practice in your life more than anything else that I can think of after visiting, working with, struggling through things, and having some pretty good successes with about a thousand dental practices. So traveling around the country, um, for those of you who do it, you realize it's not that exciting. It's a lot of hard work. And I, again, burnt out. Um, burning out isn't a badge of honor. And we want to avoid burnout. It's it's so easy just to work harder. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. Um, but we want to just try to avoid the burnout. And so how do we do it? We get excited. We do well. We grow in our chosen profession. But if we're not careful, we're going to burn out. And that's what this lecture is about. So we're going to look at a couple simple steps to avoid that burnout. Um, we want to work, as you know, smarter, not harder. We, we know that, but what are, what are some things? I'm going to do a little exercise, I, um, a, a little mental exercise for you, and let's see what you think about some of these things. Working smarter, not harder. Linear versus residual results. Linear result is when you work harder, you get more done. And residual results is when you work hard up front, and then it starts to pay off by not having to do so much, but it continues to, uh, it's like buying a good piece of real estate or something. You know, you, you buy it, you pay for it, and then over time it um, can put your kids through college or things like that. So the Benefits of compound Danny, interest. That's it. It's amazing. It's, uh, didn't Einstein yeah. say that was one thing he couldn't figure out? Just that, that it's just fantastic. Um, and yep. Danny, thanks for interrupting. Please interrupt me when I, and I'll go on tangents too. So you got to bring me back once in a while. <laughs> like um, I said, when we no, talk, one story. of the benefits is just letting you know that you're not alone out there. We're talking into a <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, Michael Gerber wrote a book, The E-Myth, and he talked about the entrepreneur, the manager, and the uh, technician. And I like to call it the leader the manager and the technician. And linear is being a, a technician. Um, prepping a single tooth is, is linear work. If you prep two teeth, you make twice as much as prepping one tooth. But doing the work, being the technician, you get kind of a one-to-one -one return on your investment. Hiring a team member, uh, that's more like being a manager. And being a technician, you get a one-to-one -one return, but being a manager, sometimes you can get a 10-to-1 return. If you do a good hire, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on as well, but if you do a good hire, um, this is something that can be residual, residually great for you for many, many years. And as we all know, if you make a bad hire, uh, it's kind of a consultant's joke, but I this is so true. Uh, I'll, I'll walk into an office and the doctor will say, Bill, you wouldn't believe it. You know, he, he's doing this, he's doing that. And 
he's always upset with patients and but he's a good hygienist but he's just being so rude and he scares people away but he's really a good hygienist and I say doctor how long has it been hey, how, how long have you been doing that oh uh, gosh 17 years you know we and, and so this is a doctor that's paid the price paid a bad price for a, a bad a bad hire um, adjusting your fees you adjust your fees and you're going to have residual results. If you adjusted your fees tomorrow, your income would go up tomorrow um, and it doesn't cost any more. No more rent, no more salary, no more equipment, no more supplies, no more lab, just more profit. So we'll definitely talk about that. I know it's not a blind spot, but sometimes we're afraid. So we'll talk about working, working through that. Um, setting production goals. It's, it's great to have a target. It's great to have a goal. Uh, everything that I teach, and I'm, I assume everybody on the call is going to put patients' needs first. And I always challenge dental teams with that, whether I'm online or in person, is that if you ever hear me saying anything that's not better for the patient, then challenge me on it, because I really want everything that I teach to be uh, highest ethical, kind, and caring. Uh, and the neat thing is, I see practices grow tremendously by putting patients' needs first. And I see myself often as patient advocate because I'm, I'm never going to let the office do anything that's not good for the patient. So setting production goals, that's like being a manager or a leader. Back to Michael Gerber, the technician, one-to-one -one return. The manager, 10-to-one -one return. The leader, 100-to-one return. We need to focus on the things. Now, you, this is so cliche, but we need to be working on our practices, not just in our practices. When we're working in our practices, that's great. We're prepping teeth. But um, just like Stephen Covey said, sharpening the saw, um, Abraham Lincoln sharpening the axe, taking time to sharpen the axe, to sharpen your systems. And it, it is sometimes a, a wee bit annoying when a doctor says, I can't take production time to have this meeting with my team. And I try to convince them. It's like sharpening the axe, sharpening the saw. It's going to be easier for you if we take the time to get the right tools at the right time. So setting production goals is key. Getting out of network with insurance. I'm excited to dive in to the whole team with the whole team with that. Um, starting a bonus system. How many of you are uh, have bonus systems in your practice? Oh, good. About half of you. Um, <laughs> I'm just guessing. Uh, We'll talk more about bonus probably. systems, but I'm a, I'm a great proponent of that. It's probably a good guess in my experience too. You think half? And okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I'm, and I'm glad we'll half or less. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing some of the nuts and bolts of your, how you structure a system. Because as you know, they can actually be demotivational if you don't provide people with the tools to oh my goodness. feel that they yeah. have a realistic shot at achieving the bonus. We, we all have stories of us changing the goal. We get there, we change it, get there, change it, and it's demotivating, yes. But I've got a system that I love. I'm excited to share with you. Absolutely love it. And I've been teaching it for 25 years, and it's only one bonus system that I think works. Um, okay, here's something. Changing systems after every lecture. You hear a lecture, good stuff. You go back, you change your office around. You hear another good lecture. You go back, you change stuff all the way around. What's that do to your team? It crushes their morale. Which, uh, yep. Oh my goodness! Or they, or well, they know if they're just patient, that. it'll yeah. If they know that if they just sit back and they're patient, they it will pass. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness! So we can't can't be doing that. Um, providing clear direction for your practice. You know, clarity is so essential. Um, we were in Sweden a few years ago, and actually, my dad, who founded Master Swimming, was uh, swimming in a swim meet for his 80th birthday in Sweden. And so we all went out there and watched him swim. And we went to this Vasa Museum. Have you ever heard of the Vasa? I have to ask you, Danny, because no one else can talk back. Have you ever heard of the Vasa? <laughs> I have not, but I'm anxious to hear about it. I've, I've heard about the Swedish <laughs> medal, too, which is they're big on swimming in Sweden, and they must be hardy to do it in that Yeah, way. yeah, yeah. You know, that yeah. Well, Dad, Dad got some world, world uh, records in Sweden, but he always got Maybe. world records. So. Um, so this is the Vasa. This is a ship that uh, is a 30-year war going on back in 1620s. And um, the king of Sweden uh, was, was fighting Rome, and he was fighting Poland and I think Czech, or Poland, Lithuania, something. And he was doing really well on the ground, but he was not doing well in the ocean. 
and they had smaller boats and he decided he wanted to build basically this is a 1628 version of the Death Star just huge imposing two rows of guns um, this thing was supposed to just dominate the ocean it was supposed to be fantastic but the king changed his mind and went from um, 24 pounder cannons down below to to 24 cannons pound cannons on both rows from 12 pound to 24 pound on the top row he went from 36 cannons and then he decided he wants 72 cannons but he didn't make much of a bigger boat he just put on more cannons and he he was losing so he had to work fast so he pushed 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 and on august 10th 1628 this boat is launched and it is beautiful it's stunning it's got statues it's painted on this picture it's not painted i took this in the vasa museum um, but it's imposing it's amazing everybody's on the ship it's it's like launching the death star they were going to win the war this thing goes out 20 minutes later it catches a puff of wind leans over water starts going in the the bottom gun deck and this thing sinks in five minutes it's it's oh probably God. the most devastating engineering failure in the history of man or one of them i mean it really is it, because they just didn't they didn't plan and and they had excessive schedule pressure he pushed 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 because he needed it done fast he changed his mind all the time i want 36 guns no i want 72 guns no i want this i want this i want to add this um they were using Swedish measurements on one side of the boat and they were going so fast on the other side, they were new, using Norwegian. So on one side of the boat, a foot is 12 inches and the other side of the boat, a foot is 11 inches. So the boat was uneven and it, it listed to port even with, they did a test right before they um, launched it and it, it failed the test. It failed a stability test, but they ignored the office, the, the obvious, and they just moved ahead. Um, the 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 shipwright died halfway through from the pressure, and they had another one. They anyway, bad thing after bad thing after bad thing. And lesson here is we 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 need to slow down often. I mean, I'd I'd love to talk for 20 minutes on um, the Vasa. It's a fascinating. If you ever get a chance to be in Sweden, um, go to the Vasa Museum, and it's kind of fun because the Swedish people. Um, we had a friend in Sweden, and he was touring us around, and and i'm i'm swedish too so i can i can say this but the swedish people when we were touring around sweden that basically the tour was um you know you americans are probably here to figure out why we're so smart and why we have such great innovations and why we're uh it's a wonderful country an amazing country great people uh but it was kind of fun on the tour it, the attitude was just that you know you're visiting here because we are so great and they are they're great people um but this is something a, a huge failure that now they have a big museum it was underwater for 333 years they brought it up they put it in this museum and it's fascinating so um, anyway i digress look it up online it's kind of interesting but what we need to think about some lessons from the vasa is we need to slow down to produce more i tell my teams all the time slow down to produce more uh, those in the military uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast and uh danny you were telling me today for running s slow is or something like that right slow down to to run yep. faster you want to run fast you got to run slow uh it's just a yeah. it's a it's a build up exercise but i did a little training in the military too and we had log pt which you may be familiar with and if you try to do that fast uh, you can't you can't keep the log up on your shoulders but you get into ah, a rhythm okay. and, and you you cover a great deal of territory but you got to slow down yeah, and so many times in practice, it goes back to that we don't take time to sharpen the saw, to sharpen the axe. We have to keep push, push, pushing. You know, I'm not going to go to a training. I'm not going to go to a webinar. I'm going to stay and, and prep more teeth because that's how we make money. And that's just wrong. That's just wrong. That's one-to-one -one return. And yes, you can make money by prepping faster and prepping more, but there, you have a limit. And so we want to go smarter. We want to slow down to produce more. Um, have you ever read any of Greg McCowan's book? He's got a um, essentialism book, and he just wrote a book on effortless 
great books. If, if you get a chance, Greg McCowan, um, Effortless and Essentialism, some of my favorite books. But in his latest book, Effortless, he talks about what is exhausting. And so many times we wrongly believe anything worth doing takes tremendous effort. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing a huge effort. And he argues, and I would agree, that that's, that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. Um, we try too hard, we overcomplicate, we over-engineer, overthink, overdo. Uh, we're, we're, we're just rolling up our sleeves and working hard. And while it is necessary to work hard, um, that can be exhausting and burnout is one of the results. So he talks about the effortless way of growing your business and improving your life. The most essential things can be the easiest ones. And we just need to look at things differently. We need to find the easiest path, not the trickiest path. And that gives us the right results without burnout. So fascinating book, highly recommended by me, Effortless. Uh, if you get a chance, take a look at it. And here's an interesting quote. Most geniuses prosper not by deconstructing intricate complexities. I mean, we sometimes think it's so hard, and it doesn't have to be. But most geniuses prosper by exploiting unrecognized simplicities. I mean, we really just need to think about maybe the simplest way is the best. Maybe we need to take the path of least resistance, not the toughest path. And um, I remember John Maxwell, who used to write about a business book a week. I knew him down in San Diego. And he would say, you know, when the work becomes the play. And I'll have to admit that I'm, my work is my play. I, I love helping offices achieve great things. I, I love I even get excited. I'm, I'm weird. I get excited for seminars like this, for webinars like this. It's just fun to to share and converse. It is. It, for me, I I just get amped up thinking about it and 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 doing it, and it's fun. So you know, when the work can become the play, and I did great preps too. I <laughs> I really I I feel like I was a really good dentist. Um, but I think I had a really good transition too because when I when I left my practice, I knew Danny that all my patients would be weeping at my doorstep because I was such a great dentist. And I left and nobody wept. <laughs> the, the practice just went on, just, just absolutely fine. My patients did fine. The team was there. Um, sometimes we think uh, that, that we're the most important part of the practice, and that's not true. Most of the time, it's your team. And most of the time, you could be replaced as long as the team's there, your patients are gonna be just as happy. That's hard to hear um, for some of you. Many of you were shaking your heads yes, and some of you were thinking, not me, you know, but that's what I thought too. But my patients did fine. And so I realized that uh, the, the work can become the play. We can enjoy what we do and have great success. And I'll have to say I had great success in dentistry and I think great success with the consulting offices that I've been working with. Um, so we need to pursue less. We need to think about saying no to everything except the essentials, you know, removing obstacles. So let's, let's start, we're going to move now kind of from the philosophical to the nitty gritty. Um, now let's start looking at dental practices. This is a dental practice that I started working with in the fall of a year, a few years ago. This is EagleSoft. Every one of those lines are a month. Something quirky about EagleSoft is, uh, if you look on the lower left, there are two Novembers. If they don't close out November properly, you get these anomalies. So um, that's not really correct. That little anomaly about an inch and a half from the left and that three January is there right before we started working together and, and that sort of thing. It's, those are anomalies. But um, what would you think and this is a rhetorical question. I'll just let everybody think. Um, how did this practice grow? Um, this practice, uh, you know, obviously grew well over over time. It wasn't just a fee increase because that's more of a stair step. But this was grow, grow, grow um, over about a year, going from about seventy-five thousand a month to um, maybe one twenty-five a month. They did great. Um, what was it? And and most people think this kind of thing is, is just adding new patients. And while adding new patients is super important, uh, we need to make sure that all of our business systems are in place 
before we start adding new patients, unless we're a startup practice. And I found a lot of practices that just aren't doing the basic marketing of, of reactivation and asking for referrals and getting good Google reviews and that sort of thing. Um, so here's an office that grew tremendously. Wonderful office. Their, their bonuses got huge uh, quickly. In fact, their bonuses, they got up to $1,000 each per full-time team member. So quickly we targeted $2,000 each per full-time per month per full-time team member. They didn't make it but they, they soared past the $1,000 per month per team member, per full-time team member. Um, they were excited. So they must have had a ton more new patients. Oh, well, I guess they didn't. They didn't. They had about the same amount of new patients. And maybe they saw a lot more patients because they got busier. Well, they, they didn't really get busier. Look at the graph on the lower right, how steep that income curve is, and look how flat the busyness curve is. Um, and th this just tells a story of a practice growing from within before we start growing from the outside. And I want to take everyone through now seven systems, I think, that are proven systems that save time and increase profit. So we're going to talk about how, how we do something like this, how we get a practice that soars like this one. And I've got more stats at the end of the presentation today. Um, but doesn't doesn't get twice as busy to get twice as profitable. And the neat thing about this, uh, frankly, most offices are working at about their break-even point. Their break-even point is where everybody is paid, including the doctor, and the doctor is getting paid for being a dentist at this level, but there's no business profit. And we need to come up with a break-even point. When I start talking about bonuses, we'll talk more about that. But my point here is just that most of this growth is profit because when this growth started, he did not have to pay more rent. He did not have to pay more team members. Um, his lab and supplies went up, but maybe that's 15%, but everything else was fixed. And so most of this growth is, is profit, which is really exciting. So how do we do it? Here's how we do it. So number one, system number one, I want to talk you through briefly. Um, this is kind of an overview of my favorite systems. So simplifying your schedule, we again need to slow down to produce more. Um, schedule for production. So do all of your schedulers know what the daily production goal is? Most offices schedule to be full. Hey, Doc's coming in, want to make sure the schedule's full or you know, Susie, how's the schedule look? Well, it's full tomorrow. Well, good, but I, I would suggest that being full and not full, not that it's irrelevant, but it's less important than, if you're running a business, if you'd like to run a business, it's less important than how much have we collected. And like when I was in practice taking a lot of time off, again, if we made our monthly goal, I would rather make our monthly goal, I'd rather collect 150000 in three weeks and take a week off rather than collecting 150,000 in four weeks. So I, I hope that I'm, I'm getting a lot of you to think right now. Just it, do I look at a schedule, um, if it's full, it's good, or do I look at a schedule, if it's productive, it's good. Take your monthly goal, divide it by the average number of days you work, maybe 16, and you come up with a dollar amount per day Back out the hygiene, and then you have the dollar amount for the doctor per day, and then we can start doing what's called these block books. Block booking is like rock, sand, and water. We've heard it so many different ways, but my preference, if we have a, say, a $5,000 doctor goal for the day, I know some of you do 15 and some of you do 2,500, but, but just for easy math, uh, let's just say $500. $5,000 per day per doctor. I'd like to see, if 5,000 is the goal, I'd like to see 2,500 done in two hours. And then I'll have six hours, typically, to do the rest of the work. So I do not, I'm not a proponent of saying new patients always go here, fillings go here, short appointments here, long appointments here, seats here, preps always in the morning, blah, blah, blah. If I can have a two-hour block once a day, and I don't care when it is, 
And if I can get the doctor to produce half of their daily goal in those two hours, then I see a schedule usually that's booked to production. So the, the block booking makes so much sense and it's such a smart way to go. And if you just have one block every day, um, I would say, doctors, you're golden. You, you'll be able to, to make your production goal, but you have to calculate your production goal and try to get half. You know, like when you're driving uh, and you look at your, your car says your average speed was 45 and you've just been driving for a while on the freeway at 70 or something. Um, that's because you had to drive through town a little bit. And if you're, if, if you're wrongly thinking, okay, I have to produce um, $500 an hour. So every hour I have to produce 500, um, that's going to get me a $4,000 day. But the problem is you have new patients. Problem is you have seats. Problem is you have buckle pit composites or something. So you can't just try to cruise along or move along at, at $500 an hour. You've got to schedule some $1,000 an hour visits. Um, often we present dentistry one tooth at a time. I remember Gordon Christensen said, why, why is most dentistry in the United States done one tooth at a time? Answer was because one tooth at a time is presented. And I would love to do a whole lecture on presenting ideal dentistry, but I feel like we should, this is a potential blind spot for everyone on the call. Are we judging our patients and trying to present something that fits their wallet? In my opinion, that's the old way. Or are we finding out what the patients want, presenting ideal, helping them get it, but not talking them into it, just offering absolute ideal. In fact, if you're thinking, well, I get 90 or 100% of case acceptance, I see that as a bad thing, not a good thing. That tells me you're fixing broken teeth. And of course you're getting 90 or 100%. But veneers aren't necessary. Whitening isn't necessary. Um, replacing some amalgams to make teeth stronger with composites to try to prevent crowns isn't necessary. But sometimes it's better. And without getting too clinical, sometimes there's a big occlusal amalgam that's, you know, it's it, most of your emergencies, if you think about it, are teeth that have amalgams that have a corner broken off. Was that preventable? Yes, we could have been more conservative and prevented dentist, prevented the crown, perhaps, if we had taken out that amalgam years ago and put in a composite to glue the tooth back together. And maybe, maybe that would prevent a crown. I, I feel like I built a practice by preventing crowns. Um, but when you do that kind of dentistry, you don't have to do teeth one at a time because we're not just telling people what they need. We're offering what they could have. And then we're saying, what would you like to do? And they might say, I'd like to just do one tooth. And we say, okay. They might say, I just want to watch them. And we say, okay. They might say, I want to do all six teeth. And we say, okay. We never talk them into doing things. But I think that, you know, if, if you treated every person like they just won the lottery, they quit their job. They were getting ready to travel around the world to places that did not have good dentists. They had to prevent emergencies. And they were taking two professional photographers and wanted to look their best. Money is no object. Time is no object. They're leaving in six months. You want to get their teeth perfect. And they can obviously afford it. In my humble opinion, that's what we should be. And I think it's most ethical and most honest to be offering, not talking people into, offering, not saying they need it, but offering ideal dentistry to each and every patient. If you did that, um, your practice would grow, your speed would increase because rather than one tooth on three patients, you might do three teeth on one patient. And if you're working on the lower right and you have a mandibular block and you're right there and uh, you know, you're, you're doing a second premolar and a first molar and a second molar all at once, um, you can do those three crowns or those three fillings a lot faster than if you were doing one tooth per patient. And the front office is happier checking people in and out. They'd rather check in one person than three. The assistants are happier turning one room rather than three. The patient's happier because they, you know, patients like longer appointments. That's another thing that's a blind spot. We think they want short appointments, but if you start asking your patients, you know, would you like to do all six or would you like to do these two at a time? Um, sometimes it's a hassle to take time off work.
sometimes it's a hassle to, to make it to the office. And sometimes your patients would just as soon pay for it. So there you go. If there are some questions, I'd love to bounce back to this, but let me, let me move on to an annual planning calendar. This is really fantastic. It's a, it's a great time of the year now to get, usually now you can get the year at a glance wall calendar for a school year. Maybe it starts in September. As we get closer to the, I guess on Amazon you can order anything. But you, you order a wall calendar, those things that are about two feet across and four feet tall, and you plan your year ahead. So when I first started doing this, I discovered that I could work 16 days every month of the year and take four weeks off and work 16 days every single month and take four weeks off. I learned to look for months where the first is on a Wednesday. Why is that important? Well, Monday, Tuesday is one month. Wednesday, Thursday is the next month. I looked for long months next to long months. I would count how many production days are each month. And if I have two months that have 18, that's a good time to try to squeeze a weekend in between there. If I have two months that are 14 or one that's short, I'm not going to try to put a week in there. Uh, there are school holidays. There are people who have a, a cruise scheduled out a week ahead of a year ahead of time. It's not perfect. That's why I had to start paying my team to vacation when I vacationed because we started taking a lot of vacations, and it wasn't fair for me to not pay the team. But again, as long as we reached our financial goals, I'd rather work less. So this annual planning calendar is great. You look at the calendar. You count how many production days are every month and you start looking for times, two long months where you can take a week off. Or you might have a short month and you have to add a couple Fridays. Or you might put a week in between two months, take a week off. The first is on a Wednesday, but on the month before, you've got to add one Friday. And the month after, you've got to add two Fridays so you could be at your minimum of 16 or 15 or 14 or whatever you, whatever you choose. Um, I'm going to move on. I'd like to say, do you have any questions? But we're going to save these for the questions. So that was number two, the annual planning calendar. It's, it's really fantastic. And think about working 16 days a month and taking four weeks off. Yeah. Uh, and we are getting, really we are getting questions, which, as you know, Bill, we'll save for the uh, Q&A section, se uh, section following your presentation. But we do have an engaged group. So good. We're, OK, no well, I hope. Uh, I, I hope I'm challenging a lot of you, and I suspect I'm really challenging a couple of you, and I look forward to it. We'll, we'll leave plenty of time for discussion um, right. afterwards. So number three, consider a bonus. Team bonus can be mo motivating when it's tied to the right metrics. So team bonus tied to whitening, no, because you could do a lot of whitenings and lose money. Team bonus tied to crowns, no, we don't want to do that. Um, and technically, I guess you could do a lot of crowns and lose money. Team bonus tied to new patients. No, technically, you could see a lot of new patients and lose money. Team bonus tied to profit. Perfect. Team bonus tied to profit is perfect because they bonus when I profit. So what we need to do, again, this is a whole lecture also. And we go over, I've got a new, a new coaching thing I want to talk to you at the end of the of the lecture, I'm planning on talking to the group about this new coaching where we go through this, but considering a bonus, we have to first come up with a break-even point. The break-even point is what it costs to run the office, as I mentioned earlier, including the doctor. So what would it cost, uh, say, if I bought your practice? How much would you have to collect before I made my first dollar? I'd have to pay all of you. Doctor, I'd have to pay you. I'd have to pay everything. At what point? Am I going to make my first dollar if I bought your practice? At that point, let's just say it's 100000 Let's just say it's 100000 to to pay all the bills, pay the doctor, but no business profit. So now I know break even is 100000 Now I tell the team, I'm going to share 20% of the collections over 100000 when we average, three-month average, rolling average. It's very important. Um, and to the group, I would be happy to email you a detailed way to put this bonus together because it's just too detailed to talk about it in four minutes. But um, 
We have a three-month rolling average. It's on collection only. It's not on production. I don't really, I mean, not that I don't care, but I cannot pay the rent with production. I can only pay the rent with collections. And sometimes this is where someone will say, well, but that not that the front office's job? No, it's not. If you send happy patients who want dentistry up to the front office, they will pay. If you send angry patients who aren't excited about the dentistry up to the front office, they can be as skilled as possible. They're not going to get payment. So it's an entire office that has to do with the collection. We focus on collection. So we start looking, we start tracking. I put a graph on my refrigerator of my office. In the refrigerator, I had juices from Costco. Back then it was called Price Club. And it was 25 cents for a, for a juice if you wanted a juice, unless we're above the line in bonus territory, then the juice was free. I wanted to train the team to look at the graph, train the team to care. Most of your teams, yeah, probably most of your teams don't even know how much you collect. Many of you are thinking, well, I don't want to tell the team how much I collect, but doctor, doctor, your team thinks you take 90% of it home as profit because they've seen the lab bills and they forget that there's rent and salaries and, and that sort of thing. So most of you, your teams think that they that you make more than you do. After a thousand practices, I know that firsthand. So we come up with a break-even point. We tell the team that we're going to share 20% of that bonus and or 20% of the profit over 100,000. So we start averaging 120,000. And so at the end of every month, if we're averaging 120,000, there's 20,000 profit. 20% of that is 4,000. If I had 14 members, they would each make $1,000. That's pretty motivating. And again, most of you are living at about your break-even point. So when your practice grows, most of it's profit. But sometimes what we do is we, you know, we, we take our team out to a beautiful place. We take our team out to Malibu and it's a sunset and we look at, we, we take them out there. We show them the beach, the ocean, see that house over there that, house has 17 car garage it has a heliport it's got four tennis courts three swimming pools spa and um if if we work work really hard and get things going and pay attention to dr kimball and do all these things he's talking about and we grow the practice all of that that you see right there can be mine all of that can be mine and sometimes we we try to grow the practice that way we tell the patients or the, the team why we need the money or we're behind on taxes. And please don't do that. That's not motivating at all. This is a beautiful way to say, hey, we need, need 50000 a month to break even. Everyone gets paid, but there's no business profit. As we start collecting over $50,000, i am going to share part of it with you. And these team members get $500,000 per month per full-time team member. My sweet spot, what I like to see in a very well-run practice is the ability for 20% of the overage to give each team member, each full-time team member, $1,000 every single month, $12,000 of bonus a year. Very, very motivating. If it's been done, it must be possible. That's my bonus. It's a good one. Next, what about your fees? It's, it's so interesting. Fees are too much. If you have low fees, your patients feel like they're too much. If you have high fees, you feel like your fees are, are too much. Um, I remember a study that was done where it was, I can't remember who it was, East Coast Consulting Company did a study to find out how high can you get crown fees before it starts lowering um, the amount of crowns that you do. And instead of a bell curve, they found a straight line. The higher fee crowns, the offices did more. I remember referring a patient out to an endodontist, very fine endodontist. I practiced in San Diego and the patient came back to me and, and had the root canal done by a dentist down, general dentist down the street. And I, I was stunned. I was quite disappointed. I tried to not look disappointed and I asked him, you know, why, why do you have this doctor do the root canal? He said, well, the general dentist charged more and I wanted the best. And I can promise you the endodontist would have done a better job, but the patient perception is sometimes, and it's true, you get what you pay for. So don't be afraid to adjust your fees. I, I literally was in an office today, and they a new office, brand new office. They said, it's time to get out of Delta. Come help us. And I'm helping them. We discovered they'd not raised their fees in 12 years. And their fees are really low. And I don't know if anyone has noticed, but there's a little bit of inflation going on right now. And 
prices are going up. So we're raising the fees significantly in this office, but from experience, I know what's gonna happen. I know how it's gonna happen and they're fine with it and they're gonna do great. Um, oh, this is kind of fun. Um, this is a restaurant that we go to sometimes, really nice restaurant. Um, and Ian, who owns Psalm's Kitchen in Paso Robles, if you're ever in Paso Robles, California, uh, fantastic restaurant. But this, it, it blows me away. Inflation, crazy stuff. He sends out these things, these emails. And here he's got a, a lunch where he's opening up 10 amazing wines. Um, and this is for lunch. And it's $500 each. But look at the bottom, join wait list. This thing fills up in about 15 minutes. I don't know, maybe an hour. So when you get an email from Ian, if you want to go to one of these things, and they're not always that expensive. I did not go to this one, by the way. Um, but, I, but I saved it to share with all of you. He keeps raising his fees. He sends out emails. And if you don't act on that email right away, you're on a wait list. The highest fee offices that I work with have the hardest time fitting their new patients in. The highest fee doctor that I've ever seen had the longest, you couldn't even get into the practice if you called and wanted to be a new patient, you had to have an invite by an existing patient. Highest fee doctor I've ever seen. So, and this is another thing that the American Dental Association did a study about why patients leave dental offices. And only 10% of the patients stated that they leave dental offices because of fees. 10% said they move away. 10% said they're perceived problems with quality. 70% of people leave dental offices because of team disunity. You know, it's, it's, it's all about team. Um, so 70% leave because of the team. 10% move away. 10% have quality problems. Only 10% leave because of price. So I hope we get some good discussion about this. Remember the old... Kodak study. Um, Danny, that was our vintage. We, we were around when everybody was calling it the Kodak study. Turns out it's not a Kodak study. It's just a business principle. Somebody from a dental journal called it the Kodak study and it kind of stuck in dentistry. Kodak has no clue what the Kodak study is. Um, but it, it's just fascinating, I think. So this says an office with 30% profitability, which might be your office that reduces their fees by 20% must increase collections by 300% to keep the same profitability. So if you cut your fees 20%, you've got to see three times as many patients. Or said uh, maybe a, a better way, if you have 70% overhead and you increase your fees 10%, so you're collecting 10% more, that does not give you 10% more profit that gives you 33% more profit. And with an 80% overhead, you get 50% more profit. With an 80% overhead, and sadly some in the group were probably dealing with 80% overhead. If you have 80% overhead and you raise your fees 20%, you just doubled your profitability. Fascinating, fascinating. Um, this is Danny where you're supposed to say fascinating. It is fascinating. Fascinating, Captain. You missed my cue. <laughs> okay, no, it's, it's, it's not, fascinating. It's an, it is an example. It's, it's sort of like a variant of compound interest. It's just that, you know, there's a very small sliver at the top of, of your income that represents profit. And so if you increase the price, other than lab fees, as you said, it's all, it's yeah. all gravy. Yeah. And, and, and we're afraid to raise our fees for the wrong reasons. And there are very few well, right think, reasons. Yeah, during the Q and A, someone asked the question before you addressed it. I think we'll we'll revisit it just so people really understand that I'm trained uh, as an economist uh, initially, originally, and this is all about price elasticity of demand. And when it comes to demand for dental care, uh, the the demand is is fairly uh, elastic. Uh, part of it has to yeah. do with just people don't shop that much. But the other thing is the conspicuous consumption effect or the perception of value that 
you get what you pay for more. You know, you pay more, you get more, which is often the case too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and our fees should, good old Linda Miles used to say, your fees should reflect, we're proud of our fees. Your fees reflect the quality of your work and your fees should reflect the quality of your work. And when we're adjusting fees, I, I use different fee surveys and I want to ask the team before we say, how much should you charge for a crown? I need to find out from the team. Should we be average? Should we be in the top third? Should we be in the top 20%? Should we be in the top 10%? You know, where, where should this office be? Well, how much is a profi? No, no, no. We're not going to talk about those prices yet. I need to know what kind of office is this? Help me get to know your practice. If, if your fees reflect the quality of your work, where should your fees be? And I love it. And this office that I was just in today at my last meeting with them, um, I asked them this question. They thought they should be in the top five or 10%. They, they, really feel like they have one of the best offices around doing some of the best in it. And I think they do. They have a fantastic quality team, but they're just charging in the, maybe the 20% lowest category of their fees. Their fees are ridiculously low, sadly. And they're still doing good numbers, but, but they're working so hard. Um, but it's so encouraging for the team to ask the team, where should our fees be? I hope all of your teams, doctors, would say, well, our offices, our office should be in the top 10% for our fees. And then you look at the survey and you realize that you're at the 50th percentile and you have to decide what you're going to do. So uh, fees, c consider looking at your fees, doctors, consider looking at your fees. So now, th this is something that has become a, a bit of a specialty of mine. Um, this is system number five, and I'm getting so many, because I've worked with so many clients, I, I get past clients calling and saying, okay, Bill, it's time for me to go out of network, or I heard your lecture and I'm ready to go out of network. What do I do? And that's what this office that I was at today, they, they brought me in to help them go out of network. Um, here in California with, with Delta Dental, if we have this Delta Premier that has good fees, but the Delta PPO doesn't have good fees, and whenever there's a sale, whenever there's a merger, whenever there's a partnership that starts or a partnership that ends, or a new doctor that buys a practice, Delta will not give them the Premier fees anymore, only the PPO fees, and they're really, really bad. They're really, really bad. So uh, going out of network with insurance. So we're not dropping the insurance. We'll still take Delta. We'll still take United Concordia. This office today, the only insurance plan they have is Delta. And they said, you know, are we dropping insurances? No, you already work out of network with all your other insurances. All we're doing now is we're going to go out of network with Delta. And so, so many doctors are calling me and asking me about Delta. Now, this is a very ugly slide and I apologize for it. But um, this is an analysis that we do customized to the office where we look at the procedures that you do, most dollars come in from these procedures, and how many did you perform, and what's your UCR fee, and then what are your insurance fees? So this Humana, they get 880 for a crown, a 2750, a PFM. They get 880, but their UCR is 1566. So they've got MetLife, Guardian, some of these big ones, they are giving 47% off. Now, if you have 80% overhead and you give 40% off, you're sunk. Yep. But the reason we're doing okay is because we don't do this analysis, so the practice is doing okay. What happens is these patients on the left side of the chart are making the office profitable, and the patients on the right, you're treating for free, but you don't know it. So you need to analyze and see what insurances are the worst and what insurances are the best. And kind of interesting, in this sample, I didn't notice it till the other day, this UCR fee that they have is the same as Delta Premier. And I know there must be, with all the doctors we have on this call, there must be some of you that, that are sure that when you signed up for Delta, you signed something that said your UCR fees had to be the same as your Delta Premier, and that's wrong what you actually signed was something that said your Delta Premier fees will be lower than your UCR, the same or lower. And this office that I was at today, they had wrongly and sadly kept all of their cash fees the same as their Delta fees for decades. And they just realized that no, Delta, Delta looks good when you charge 
fifteen hundred for something and they give you eight hundred for something. It makes Delta look good. So if you have your UCR fees, your regular cash fees, your usual customer customer custom usual customary and reasonable fees, your UCR fees, cash fees, if those fees are the same as your Delta fees, your Delta Premier fees, you really need to look at that because Delta and Dr. Bill Kimball both want you to have your UCR fees higher than your Delta Premier fees. Please, please, please. I thought about making a 50% off coupon for marketing, Danny. That's my, I don't, I don't get into marketing. I like to refer to people like you, um, but my new marketing gimmick is just a half off card. And what do you think, Danny, if we just, just told all our offices to just give 50% off everything, they'd probably get a lot of new patients, right? They sure 50% would. 50% off everything. Yeah. Yeah. But the, but most teams would say, well, I'm not going to do, do that. No way. Don't do it. No way. But Look at this, with this practice, this is a real practice. Their last one, two, three, four, five insurances over on the right there. They're doing it. They're giving more than, they are. They're giving that half off card. And, and so consider going out of network with insurances. Um, most offices will lose patients. I have lots of experience with this. Most offices lose five or 10% of patients. When we recently did, lost 13%. The worst I've ever seen is a practice that lost 24% of their Delta patients when they went out of network with Delta. Most of the offices that I work with by far are fully insurance independent, meaning they take all insurances, but they work out of network. But even this office, an office down in Fullerton, wonderful practice, in fact, he was so excited about going out of network with Delta. He, he lectured to his dental society about why everyone should go out of network with Delta. Um, he lost 24% of his practice. I was stunned because it's a fantastic practice. But his net income and his gross income went up after he did that. And a lot of those patients came back. I was just going to say was, that. A lot the, of the patients the, come back. Yep, two-way door. Yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. So they go somewhere else and they come back. But the break even for most practices is you're going to make more money. You're going to have higher profit if you go out of network with Delta as long as you don't lose half of your patients. The break even is about 50%. The break even usually is about 50%. And it's good to calculate that ahead of time. But it's good to go into it knowing, like with the VASA, they went, didn't know about the shipbuilding. They'd never built a ship with two rows of cannons before in Sweden. They'd never done it. And they just decided they were going to do it. Um, if you've never done this before, don't try this at home without help. Work with your consultant or work with a good consultant. Um, but if you if you lose less than half your patients, you're going to make more money. And the worst I've seen is 24%. So you'd have to be twice as bad as the worst office, the, the, the office that lost the most patients I've ever seen. You'd have to lose twice that many patients, be, not to lose money, but just to break even. I mean, it's really a slam dunk if you look at like these insurances to the right. And what we usually do is we start on the right and we might drop the, the three on the right and then the next three on the right and then the next. Some, sometimes like this MetLife I think was really big so we might have skipped over that and gone out with Guardian and Aetna first and GEHA and then came back. But we, we work our way over. Usually the last one is Delta Premier. But I'm a proponent of going out of network with even Delta Premier because I hope it's a significant difference from your cash fees. Oh, fair enough. Should we move on to team building? Let's, Let's do move it. on to team building. That was number five. Number six, teamwork. Not everything has to be so hard. Remember that people leave dental offices because of the team, not because of the price, not because of the insurance, not because, you know, it's only 30%, all these other things. It's 70% people leave dental offices because your team isn't perhaps the right team. Um, I really like what Patrick Lincioni has to say about team. Hungry, humble, and smart. Um, humble, hungry, and smart. Um, we want to look for that, these traits when we hire people. We want them to be humble. It's tough when they think they know everything or when they, you know, when they think they know everything. Um, C.S. Lewis has a great quote about humility. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking about yourself less when you're humble. 
we want to look for people that are humble. We need people who are hungry. Um, I mean, they, they need to need to work. They need to need to work. And the bonus works great. Not the bonus isn't a bribe. It's supposed to be a reward. And the bonus is not the only thing that's going to change your practice. Your team culture has to be such that your team trusts you and you have integrity and you have a direction that the practice is going in and you have values. And then as the practice grows, we have this bonus to reward the team. So, so don't hear me in that I think that the bonus is the secret to having a happy team. But it does help. I, I was in an oral surgeon's office just the other day, looked out the window, saw an assistant, Alma, from a dental office that I'd worked with years ago, walking over to her new, not new anymore, car that she bought with her bonus money. And I thought, there's Alma. Ah, there's the parking lot. There's her car. I helped her get that car. And it was just a feel-good moment. Um, but they, were, they, they turned about, out to be a great team because they learned from the doctor, they learned from us, and that sort of thing. So uh, it's not all about bonus. It's looking for people who are humble, hungry, and smart. EQ, not IQ emotional quotient, not intelligence quotient. We need people who know how to get along with other people. Um, team members that don't get along, uh, we, we need to more, be more serious about this. And I joked about that, you know, he's been doing this or she's been doing this for 17 years. A lot of times we put up with team members that have bad attitudes because they're good workers and we don't realize how many patients we're losing. Um, Here's an interesting exercise to find out, because you're all thinking, well, we don't lose that many patients. How many new patients, or how many hygiene days did you have five years ago? You had, yeah, I'm going to say five days of hygiene. Maybe six days, say you have six days a week of hygiene. You know, you have two double days, four days of hygiene, and then two days. You have six days a week of hygiene five years ago. How many days a week of hygiene do you have now? Six. So we had six five years ago. And six now. How many new patients do you get? Oh, we get 30 new patients a month. How many patients do you lose a month? Eh, not many. You see where I'm going with that? If, if your practice is the same size as it was five years ago, number of hygiene days, number of patients coming in, and you, you were getting 20 new patients a month, or 80 new patients a month, let's say 20 new patients a month you're getting, um, you're losing 20 patients a month. Think about that for a minute. If your hygiene department has not been growing regularly, you're losing as many patients as you're gaining. So we need, it's like a leaky bucket, and we've got to close the back door. And the way we do it is not lower prices, and sadly, it's not even higher quality. But interestingly, it's having a happy team. If you have a happy team, patients don't leave the practice. And what's it all about? It's all about trust. Trust is the engine oil of frictionless teams. Stephen Covey did a survey, I think 273,000 people. Crazy. How did he do that? Um, and he looked at what people liked to follow in a leader. And people would say things like um, gregarious and visionary and, and bold and strong and good speaker and this and that, but there was one thing that stood out twice as much as anything else. The highest thing that people want to follow is integrity. And when I first read that, oh, decades ago, I think, I'd been working with quiet, mild-mannered, couldn't hold a conversation dentists that had amazing practices, and then I'd work with other doctors who were gregarious and visionary and um, you know, just fun people to be around and they also had nice practices. And I, I realized it's integrity. If we do what we say and say what we do, team members really appreciate that. So contemplate that a little bit. Um, how are you doing on being trustworthy? And how are you doing uh, holding up integrity? That also means if you tell somebody that you know they have to show up on, t on time or else, and then you say that again, you say that again. Um, in my own practice, I actually went to a therapist and I had to go to a therapist because I had somebody who just, I would let people push me around. Maybe I'm kind of a people pleaser. I don't know. I was. Now I'm not. <laughs> but but I had team members that were, I would tell them they had to do this and they wouldn't do it and I wouldn't do anything about it. And I actually went to a therapist and kind of got over it and 
fired the front office person and the practice grew. Uh, and I, 80% of the time when I practiced, I had a coach, always had a coach pushing me. Um, so anyway, work on your trust, whatever it takes, even if it takes going to a therapist so you can follow through on what you're supposed to do. Um, okay. That is trust. Now let's looking at let's look at happiness. How many of you have seen this TED talk by Sean Acor called The Happiness Advantage? It's a fantastic, I think, 17 minute video that you really should watch with your team. It's funny. Um, it makes some great points. But just by being happy around the office, and I know it sounds soft and fluffy, but um, the happiness advantage, he's a Harvard researcher. And they found out that people who are happy as opposed to neutral or negative, their productivity goes up 31% and they're 37% better at sales. And doctors are 19% more accurate with diagnosing. So you can do better at diagnosing if you can feel better about being at the office. The challenge with trying to be happy is he says you have to – we make happiness over the cognitive horizon. We have to achieve something to be happy. But what happens is, is we achieve it and then we set the goal higher and we're not happy. And then we achieve that and we set the goal higher and we're not happy. And he has, says you have to kind of turn it around. It's a really fun TED Talk. Um, but please write this down. Sean Acor, TED Talk, The Happiness Advantage. You'll, you'll really enjoy watching it. Um, I have probably literally watched it a hundred times because I show it to teams. Um, and it's it's always good. It's always interesting. Um, and again, I know it that sounds soft and fluffy, but if the American Dental Association is telling me that most of my patients leave because the team isn't happy, maybe we should focus on creating an environment that's safe and happy. And even if it doesn't change anything, we'll be happy. <laughs> so, so maybe that's the truth. We don't care. We think we're 37% more <laughs> better at sales. We're probably not, but we're just, we feel like well, we are. If we're, um, we're going to spend that much the percentage of our lives at work, we might as well be happy. It's a, that's a, I'm definitely going to watch it. It's a great, it's, great It's resource. fantastic. And this, this isn't in the TED Talk. So I'm going to tell you a short story about Sean Acor doing some research. I think Harvard research where they had newspapers and they had college students and they would give the college student $5 if they flipped through the newspaper and counted how many pictures were in the newspaper. So they would, if they got the number right, 27 pictures or whatever it was, they'd give them five bucks. College students love that. You know, just, just flip through, count pictures. Interesting thing is on the second page, they had in a bold headline, stop the survey now and we'll give you $50. Stop the survey now and we'll give you $50. And they had two groups of people. And one group got the $50 80% of the time. And one group got the $50 20% of the time. One group saw that headline 80% of the time. Almost all of them saw that headline and got the 50 bucks. This other group, only 20% of them saw that headline. 80% of that other group the other group, got $5. What was the difference? What were the two groups? The two groups were optimists and realists. Optimists see, they just see more opportunity. And it's just fascinating. They made more money. And I think we do that in our business too. The optimists make more money. There was a huge insurance company that did a study on why employees stayed. Because it's, it's expensive to change out employees, as you all know. It's a hassle. It's expensive. And they found out one of the traits that they're, they're going to start looking for, and they could maintain more employees that would be with the company longer, is optimism. So well, again, it the, sounds the, soft and yeah, fluzzy, but wow. It does, but a, I think you're doing a good job of quantifying it. I think, too, when we're negative, it, you tend to get tunnel vision. We feel like we're focused. We have to do something. And so we don't we lose the fun, the lightness. And when we're light and happy, I think we're far more open to possibility and creativity and seeing things that other people that are have their head down and are taking care of business and being really serious are going to miss. So that's one of the, that's a great takeaway that you're sharing because it's counterintuitive. Yeah. We think that you, if it's worth, 
it, if it's worth achieving, we it has to be hard. That's what you said. To work hard. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. It's that effortless book. It's just, and and I have learned after. I mean, I guess I've been doing this twenty five, almost thirty years. Um, you know, studying the business of dentistry, and which is really just studying business and applying it to dentistry. It's just the language that I know and the language I was trained in. Um, it's not just working hard. I mean, yes, you have to work hard. Don't be lazy. It doesn't work. But but there's so much more to it. And there's a path of least resistance. There's an easier path and you'll make more money. And these students that were just optimistic, I don't think they were smarter. I don't think they worked any harder. In fact, I'll bet the pessimist no. group worked harder and more diligently no. counted. And I won't take a lot so, of time here, but I, I want to share just really briefly the the result that I got. You, Some people know that I like to climb oh, mountains. Great. And, uh, and there was one that I tried to climb for 12 years over four different expeditions and the fourth time was it was make or break and again i you know i felt like i have to get to the top of this mountain it's my last chance and i'd hit a wall at the at twenty one thousand feet and i think oh here it comes again and i saw another climber going past me who was like smiling had his head up <laughs> would take a couple steps would turn around take in the view and he was clearly having a good time and it was like an epiphany for me it was an epiphany mm. i thought i'm killing mm. myself here where all I have to do is take a step, look around, remember what spectacular surroundings I'm in and enjoy the process. And it worked. It, after that, it was like a big weight had been taken off my back. Oh, that's so, an awesome story. That's a, that's a fantastic story. Love that story. Yeah. So we need to just open our eyes, look for opportunity and relax and enjoy. So that's what it, gratitude. So that was number seven. We, we made it through these seven systems, team, and now we're just looking at gratitude, exactly what we were talking about. When you focus on what you lack, you lose what you even have. When you focus on what you have, you get what you lack. So focus on what you have and be grateful. Here's some things that I'm grateful for. Um, I got this text at 1036 this morning. And from one of my agents, I have a, a brokerage, Integrity Practice Sales, here in California a company we started about 12 years ago, and it's one of the biggest practice brokerages in California. I think we're number two. Um, and one of my agents said, and he's going to be lecturing to a group of dental students, he says, in the pool of offices you guys work with, what would you say is the average activity for 2021 along with year-to-date 2022 compared to 2019? Was it on par or below or above? This is just this morning. And I wrote back, I believe every office we're working with except one is doing better or much better now compared to 2019. We've been kind of making it a habit to skip over 2020 because it's hard to compare practices in 2020. So it makes for a nice comparison, 19 and now. And then I, I got curious. So I went through the practices that I'm working with and looking at actual client numbers, 19 to 22. Um, this first practice went from an average of 101 a month to 138. The next one, 41,000 a month to 56. 156,000 a month to 193. 94,000 a month to 126. 78 to 123. 303 to 384. Um, 204 to 236. 65 to 57. But then when I went back, um, it was actually 65 to 72. That was just January of this year. So that didn't really count. But I am I am very grateful for my clients. I mean, they, they bring me joy. And they're on average, 2019 compared to today, they're up $35,000 a month on average. Not bad. I suspect the feeling's mutual, Bill. <laughs> they, yeah, <laughs> they like me. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, have a, I have a client who's sending me on a very nice vacation in, in August. It's all, all expense paid to a very luxurious spot as a thank you which is really great. And they could afford to do it because they're making a lot more money. So I am, I am very grateful for my clients. It's exciting to be working with so many wonderful offices. I'm really grateful for my family. Um, I have three kids, two are married. Uh, Trevor runs the brokerage, PhD from Oxford. Um, Elise um, was recently married. She was the beautiful bride in the picture that you saw earlier. Um, she works for Scribber, a company out of uh, Norway, I think. She edits PhD level stuff of people who don't speak English or something like that. And she pours wine in the local winery. Um, and I got trained in Scotland as a veterinarian. We're going to go to a wedding next week in Scotland, friend of hers. Um, and 
we're waiting for her maybe to, who knows when she'll get married. Um, and my wife Hope and I like just celebrated bill. 36 years. I do, as a matter of fact. We've toured Oban before and um, oh, spent cool. a lot of time over there. Trevor went to the school in Oxford and Anna went to school in Glasgow. So we spent a lot of time over in the UK. And yes, I, I'm a wine guy, but I, I enjoy a, a mild hey. scotch. Did I hear you say you're married 36 years? 36 years. Yeah, Diana and I just celebrated 36 years last week. That's marvelous, Bill. Hooray for us. It is. It is. Yep. So I feel very blessed. I'm very grateful. And everybody, thanks for listening. I'm looking forward to getting into the Q&A time. Yes, we are too. And uh, speaking of gratitude, I know I speak for everyone in attendance that uh, we, we appreciate the uh, the great advice the, and, and the, the, the time went really quick. And, you know, before we jump into Q&A, you talked about uh, a relatively new project, uh, uh, an entity that you've created, I think it's called the Build-Up Group, and I wondered if you could maybe tell us a little bit about that, as well as all the other interests that you have. I want to hear about your, your wine group as well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I thought I couldn't talk about everything. I'd love to talk all about wine. I'm studying French wine right now uh, for to become a French wine scholar, and that's uh, very interesting, I think. Uh, but so now I get to do my infomercial. You're going to let me do my infomercial. I'll make it short and sweet. Oh, there it is. Go right ahead. This, this, this is the build-up group. This is the build-up group. It's a, it's a new group. We just finished or we're finishing our first cohort. What we do is put a group of dentists together. We meet once a month on Zoom. It's kind of like consulting in a box. So uh, it's, it's all the material that I do in my regular consulting, but um, – it's run by me. Hillary Fritch was an, uh, is a dentist who um, I helped her locate, find, grow, and sell a tremendously profitable practice in Carmel, California, and she just moved up to Montana. So she's really excited about being part of the group. And then Trevor, my son, who, like I say, runs the brokerage, kind of the brains behind the operation, and um, helps me with my consulting. So that's our that's our build up group. The three of us meet with. Now we're just we're starting our second build up group. So this is this is new. Um, and so now we get to get into wine. I'm I'm going to do an offer for those of you who are on, here's the infomercial part. Um, join us for some wine here in Paso Robles. This is a group that oh by the way this group um, she bought the practice. She went out of network with Delta. She raised her fees significantly. All her friends said, don't do it. I was confident. She did it. She doubled her practice. She doubled her practice within the first year, doubled her practice doing all these things that most of the doctors on this call would say, well, you can't do that. But we did it the right way. And so anyway, back to the build-up group. Um, I am offering, we're starting our second cohort. It's nine months long. It's $12,000. I'm offering $2,000 off and get this, this is <laughs> kind of fun, a full day team building wine retreat. I will personally, for the first five people who sign up, I had to, you know, but, but how fun. Um, and this is what we're doing here in this picture. We're, we went to lunch, a winery, another winery, then out to dinner and we talked about the winery, the winery service, the wines. We did some team building. Um, so anyway, that's my offer. The build up group, online cohort, we, we talk about all these things we talked about today in more detail. We encourage, it's really fascinating. You get a group of dentists talking online and uh, it's great. I learn, I teach, I learn, probably learn more than I teach on these calls. Uh, it's been really fun and we're looking to start our second group. It's gonna be in late August. So we're, we're starting to take reservations. And if you wanna sign up and put a deposit in by July 7th, um, you get 2000 off, and if, you, if you're one of the first five, and if you want to, um, I will personally host a all-day wine retreat with your team uh, in Paso Robles or Santa Barbara or wherever you'd like to go. Um, you pay for food and wine, and I will um, let you hopefully enjoy my Level 3 sommelier wine information, and uh, we'll have a lot of fun. I'm sure that would be that will be awesome. And if you said this, forgive me for missing it, but uh, how many people do you accept in, in the cohort? Is there a limit? We try to have a dozen. We try to have a dozen in the group. So it's not a huge amount. And so we're on, we've all done Zoom before and we, um, you know, you, you have, you Zoom. We Zoom once a month for a couple hours. We do it on Friday mornings. Um, we were doing it Friday morning at eight. We're going to start next group Friday morning at nine. Um, it's, I think, the last 
week in August that we're going to start it. It's once a month. It's nine months. Um, and we grow practices by doing that. So that's that's kind of it, it's a Zoom course with some personal coaching. It's a new program, so we're we're offering more. You know, we're offering more for less sort of thing because mm -hmm. we're just getting it up and running. And that's why I'm I'm happy to. Uh, I shouldn't tell you this, but I'd probably be happy to do it anyway. But <laughs> spend a day that's with right. you that's and obvious. your team, team building. Yeah, team building. <laughs> You're learning about wine. I'll give you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you know, teams. We we had such a fun time. So anyway, that's my that's my infomercial, and I'm ready for questions. Good. Well, thank you. Leave that up there so people can uh, uh, absorb and jot down your contact info. Although we'll be following up with an email uh, shortly uh, the next day or two. But yeah, let's dive into questions. And thanks for that uh, that generous offer for sure. Absolutely. Okay, first question is uh, when do you recommend that the patient pay for treatment? At scheduling, hmm. prep, or delivery? Scheduling, when by far, recommend? it's my most predictable, it's my most predictable system. Um, we, we offer a patient a 5% courtesy, but we don't say 5%, so it might sound something like this. Oh, Danny, Dr. Kimball's gonna do those veneers for you. He does such beautiful veneers. Um, so let's see, your total fee is gonna be 8,000, and uh, and your insurance will cover this much, so I, you know, we're estimating this much. Now, and then here's the script. A lot of our patients like to take advantage of our prepayment courtesy, and the the savings to you would be four hundred dollars. Would that work for you today? And if you say it that way, you're going to get fifty percent of your patients paying sure. at time of schedule. Sure. So it's well, it's and, and paying the dollar amount instead of the percentage is a much higher perception of value too. Five oh, percent is nothing. Four hundred dollars right. is a lot. Four hundred yep. is five percent, exactly. but yeah, that's right. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, how you say it? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Anything else you want to say about that? Uh, it's a very predictable system. Um, if if patients have to bring money at time of service, they can cancel appointments. If you just collect money at time of service, every time a patient walks in, you have your hand out for money. If you do this prepayment courtesy, uh, one, it's kind of nice. The first month you'll get one and a half income because you're collecting a lot from next month. Um, that only happens for one month, but then the next month you only have to talk money once rather than four times. No, I like um, and you're make, separating. Make their and you're separating. Yeah, you're separating the financial transaction from the service delivery, which I think it yeah. goes a long way in terms of relationship. Uh, yeah, a lot of your patients that are sick or have an important meeting and they can't make the appointment. Truth is, they decided they couldn't afford it, but they're not going to say that. So they're just going to say, "I'm sick today," and if you would have collected the money. They'd show up, right? And, I guess and you're their, having their an opportunity have to have tires. a conversation, right? Instead of yeah. instead of them just being able to kind of not 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 be confronted, but you can have a, a, a communication. If the person doesn't accept, then you can you can probe and say, well, you know, it sounds just like this is something that you're interested in doing. Uh, and if we could help make it more make it affordable, would that make a difference to you? you know, yeah. And then yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. That's, whatever yeah. plans you may have in place. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's uh, great. So a it's a wonderful one. system. Here's a okay. tough question because I know you've seemed equally passionate about all seven, but uh, if you had to rank order, because uh, that's what this oh questioner wants, what do you think are the most important systems of the seven you presented? I, you know, I, team maybe has to be number one. If if you can get a great team, um, but the the easiest, if you're bold enough to adjust your fees, oh my goodness, you know, that, that can make such a huge difference. And, and really for probably over a decade, if an, if an office wouldn't do my bonus, I wouldn't work with them. I feel very strongly about the bonus. If it's set properly, if you go trying to set it too low and change, raising it all the time, but if you set it well, um, that, that bonus, so bonus, team, and adjusting fees maybe um oh they're all important danny but, but <laughs> a bonus. i Think agree with the, the order bonus. so far yep and Adjust setting it based fees. on profitability and then everybody feels they yeah. have you know uh it, it, it's fair then because the people that are if you're yeah. doing it based on new patient appointments and only certain people answer the phones then the other people don't really get a shot at the bonus and that's not fair well that's what you want for marketing you want people answering the phone well because you can have, make the phone ring that's your job and if they I can't schedule the appointments do. Oh my goodness! I hear you. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So. Okay. Oh, and there are. Well, let's leave it at that. Teams, fees, and bonus. You know, yeah. 
Yes, absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Do those uh, and your practice will grow. Okay. And uh, just this, this late arrival, what would be the next step for someone interested in joining your build-up group? Um, give me a call until the 5th because I'm heading out to Scotland. Um, then give Trevor a call. So I put his number there. Or send us an email or go to the build-up group. Um, just contact us. I mean, I, you know, I, it'd be fun to think that there are going to be 40 people calling my phone right when we hang up. But, you know, if a few of you call. So it, it's a small group. It's very personalized. And so contact us in any way. Just, just contact me or contact Trevor and say, hey, I'm interested. I want to do this. And I hope you say, hey, I'm interested. I want to bring my team out to Paso Robles and do a wine retreat, too. Uh, mm -hmm. well, I'm hoping to get that, a few of those, too. I'm clearly not the only one that was curious because uh, a few people asked about <laughs> the team building wine retreat. Tell us a little more about that. Well, this is I, I just started a business called Find the Right Wine. Like I don't have other things to do, but it's it's just a passion of mine. And um, it's it's been fun. I've taken a few dental teams out wine tasting. And it's a great team building. You know, we don't do ropes course. We don't do trust falls. We just, <laughs> you better not while you're wine tasting. But um, we live in a beautiful area. We've, we've got uh, 50 wineries within 10 minutes of my home. Five zero wow. wineries within 10 minutes of my home. And, and I know a lot of the winemakers. And um, so we'll go to some of my friends' wineries. They'll treat us right. Uh, we'll taste some wines. Then we'll get together and kind of debrief. Um, this group, we actually did a two-day where we, you know, the next day we went out to lunch and talked about what we learned at the different wineries. Not, not so much about wine, but about team building. And I, I would customize it. So I, you know, talk to the doctor ahead of time and say, what, what should we, what, what do you want to focus on? I mean, maybe we use this as an opportunity to present a bonus and drink some wine. I don't know, but you oh, got me for the day. That's leverage. And, yeah, cool. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, which, yeah, yeah. Which is. Well, that leads into the next question, and really the last one. The other ones I think you pretty much answered about going out of network, and we talked about the fees increase doesn't really lessen demand. If anything, it could increase it. Um, and you talked about taking six weeks off. The last question I've, we've got time for is do you offer these wine retreats as a standalone service? Uh, you know, I, I do. I don't even really have a fee for them. Call, we'll talk about it. I I mean, my hope is that you want to be in the build-up group, and then we do the – that but yes absolutely and i think i think there's a i think there's a fun benefit to do you know someone crazy like me uh, who knows a lot about wine to have a a dental team building group we we had a heck of a oh, great time yeah. with this with this crew and um it's really fun and it's interesting and and uh you know for people who know absolutely nothing about wine it's a kick to teach them the basics and for people who know a lot about wine we geek out over certain kinds of wines and uh so at any level um and there's going to be a beer drinker in the group and there's going to be a non-drinker in the group and that's absolutely <laughs> fine that, I mean, really that's yep. absolutely fine yeah so well i having, um, knowing you for 25 years i know that you're a fun and interesting guy and i think that people have gotten a taste for that as well so uh i think that talk about infomercials i think just the whole presentation gives people <laughs> a, an idea but the idea that you're not just going to be drinking wine and talking about wine is a chance to sit down and, and talk shop. So there really is, that's a very generous uh, offer opportunity to uh, yeah, kind of sample. I, I guess it's a whole. day of consulting over wine. <laughs> Sounds like it. For especially just, if we, for just the price we get of the you wine. to drink and not, right. And, and get you to not spit it all out. Right. Drink a little. When you go pro, you spit, but, but yeah. still. Uh, <laughs> I greatly respect you and, and love referring people to you and love what you do. So it's really fun to be part of your group today. No, it Thank has you. been great. I still remember we met you back at the, the, the first meeting of the Speaking Consulting Network. You and I were charter members. Yeah. And what good, was that, 95? I think oh, my goodness. Yes, I think so. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. More than two years ago. Yeah. Yes, yeah, a little bit. My goodness. A little bit. Oh. All right. Well, with that, let me just thank you again and, and let all you attendees know that in a few days you will indeed receive an email with instructions on how to apply to receive your CE credit. And again, please note that the code for this course is KIM063022. You will need this One code. One more thing, so Danny? Please. Go right ahead, Bill. 
One more thing. I would be very happy if you give me a call or an email just to talk about anything. If there's a question that we didn't answer, if there's, uh, you know, you don't have to just call to sign up. You can call and ask a question. Happy to share bonus information with you. Happy to send you a system. Um, you know, so I please feel free to, to call or write anytime. I just want to make busy as I know clear. you are. That, yeah, that's very generous too, Bill. Thank you for offering that. Yeah, my pleasure. My All pleasure. Right. And now I invite you to mark your calendars for Thursday, July 21st at 6 p.m. Central Time, when my guest will again be the amazing Dr. Tom Neighbors, who will deliver his presentation titled Keystone Pathogens of the Human Mouth, Systemic Inflammatory Pathways and the Comorbidities They Cause. See, we can think with both sides of our brain here. We like, we like to flip it from <laughs> practice management to clinical and then back again. Uh, and Dr. Neighbors is a, is a dynamic uh, speaker. I, I love the man. I've known him for, for going on 20 years. He spent over 40 years researching and developing a clear understanding between a medical grade definition of periodontal infection and how these infections are directly related to chronic systemic diseases. Tom is a nationally recognized authority on the use of DNA PCR as a critical component in both oral and general health and disease issues. As an attendee, you will understand the two historical paths of periodontology and their importance, why the periodontal probe is not sufficient to diagnose disease, why periodontal infections differ from patient to patient, how and why a saliva test has become the gold standard for diagnosis and treatment planning, and why treatment and why treating periodontal infections should not be a procedure-driven protocol. It all happens on Thursday, July 21st at 6 p.m. Central. Until then, this is Danny Bobro thanking you for your ongoing commitment to practice perfection and thanking you again, Bill Kimball. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, Danny, and thanks to the group.